At night, in a place of calm and former safety, something is wrong. It's too dark, and that friendly merchant is missing. The fire is snuffed out. As you step into the shack, or walk out into the night, or generally investigate your surroundings, it happens. Out of the darkness, a hunter rises. Hello and welcome back again to Rage Gaming, my name is Hollow and today I'm back for my second lore video for Elden Ring. After the encouragement from Josh, I finally made that first one on the information we find in-game to connect the dots with speculation alongside some popular theories that I appreciated at the time. It was something that I wanted to try since I first started making videos on the From Software games like nearly a decade ago, but I never attempted for various reasons. But I was convinced that it's still worth a try, especially since it's something that, you know, I'm passionate about, so we gave it a go. So before I get into today's topic, I want to say a thank you for the kind words and the support on my first attempt. I was definitely overly worried about making mistakes or missing something and regretting not having it in the video, but it was made really clear to me by a lot of you guys in the comments that there's value in making something that you're passionate about. And yeah, unfortunately there were things that I feel like I missed for the video about the Glomide Queen, a couple items I wish I'd actually included, but these videos are never going to be perfect, I'm just going to do my best. Obviously we did not expect the response we got to that first video, it felt really welcoming, so a huge thank you for that. And we had a lot of cool theories and suggestions to further what they were talking about in that topic. Like even, yeah, the items I missed. It's exciting because I learned more about the topic myself as well. But enough of that, let's get into today's video. I'll be once again basing everything off in-game items, which provide the official details and lore. Then I'll be connecting the dots with speculation where needed. Today, we're talking about that hunter who constantly forces surprise encounters on you in what was previously a place of rest and safety. An awesome callback, I think, to my favorite boss fight concept, a boss that hunts you. Rather than you enter an arena clearly set out for a boss fight, you are suddenly attacked by an enemy who is going to try to defeat you not once but multiple times throughout the game. Much like the way you fail a boss fight only to try again, this guy comes back for you. Of course, I'm speaking of the Pursuer from Dark Souls 2, the Terminator-style knight who attacks you in various locations all around the world. And it's funny to me that, yeah, one of my favorite boss concepts comes from Dark Souls 2, but it goes to show that even though that game has a lot of fair criticism, it still has a lot of cool and unique and great things about it. Today in Elden Ring, though, we face a very similar concept, the bell-bearing hunter, Elmer of the Briar, and one of the major lands outside of the lands between, Eocade. By the way, while I am pronouncing it for this video, e o k the word actually seems to come from Old Irish, and I've seen that described as yo -he, which is pretty weird. So while I'm not sure the exact origin of the way From Software wants me to say it, I'm going to stick with the British version, which is e o k Now the topic of this hunter is interesting on its own, but I think it becomes especially engaging when we consider the clean rot knights of Melania, the warriors who are infected with the rot who require those prosthetic limbs to fight. The source of these limbs is seemingly part of the Shaded Castle, where we find Elema the Hunter for your final fight, and the things that Elema did actually affected the Clean Rot Knights. So this has been a surprisingly big topic from something that I was like, oh yeah, that character's cool, I want to learn more about him. And here we are, we've got a big video. Let's begin with our more than likely first encounter with the ball-bearing hunter then. At the north end of Limgrave is the Warmaster Shack, and at night, when we enter the shack, the invasion takes place. But it's actually not a true invasion at all. You aren't warned of an impending invasion via the UI like normal, and the enemy doesn't have that red appearance at all of an invader. What you face instead is something else. It's this large knight with a unique combat style, where he's using a large executioner's sword and using sort of incredible telekinesis to attack you in a variety of ways. It's a simple but really cool concept, like fighting a sort of knight Sith Lord all of a sudden. And that knight's also covered in a strange briar. It wraps around his shield and his body and even part of his weapon. He never says a word to you. He just suddenly appears and attacks. And if you overcome this challenge, you will be rewarded with the bell he bore, the bone peddlers in this case. From this, we learn that it is not actually the hunter's bell, but his victims. This hunter knight killed a merchant and took his bell bearing. But whoever this murderer was, at least he's gone now, right? And so ends a strange encounter. Until, of course, we encounter him not once more, not two, but three more times in the open world. Once in the lake region, once in Kaelid, and once again in the Altus Plateau. Each time, though, he's stronger, 
He's harder to kill, he's more deadly because he's got higher damage. Whoever this hunter is, he's actually a very talented fighter, and he seems to be learning from your encounters and coming back stronger. Each time we defeat him, we get another bell bearing, which is another type of merchant who was a victim of the hunter. Our final encounter though is the fifth, found at the top of the shaded castle in the Altus Plateau. We once again meet the hunter, but now we see his true name, Elmer of the Briar, finally facing you in true. This being the hardest version of the fight, and the final one, because after we defeat him, he drops both his weapon and shield, and we can finally learn, like, what's going on here. We have the Marius Executioner Sword and the Briar Great Shield. The sword description tells us a surprising tale, that Elmer, the hunter, is actually not the owner of the sword, he stole it. It belonged to House Marius, who were a family of executioners, tied to the Golden Order, as we will detail later on. So famed and respected was this sword, that it's a legendary armament, a family sword with a big history. The Shaded Castle belonged to House Marius, who has now fallen to ruin, and the castle has been lost, and their sword stolen, because a bloody rampage occurred here. Elmer was destined for death, sentenced to be executed here in the Shaded Castle. However, somehow he stole the sword from the executioner site and combined it with his own unique battle skills originating from his home. Eocade. Elmer, a doomed criminal, was able to break free, steal the sword, and then use an executioner sword, which isn't made for battle by the way, to completely take over the castle. He was able to single-handedly destroy House Marius, which is really impressive. The shield tells us more though. The shield comes from a foreign land, and utilizes the briar that wraps around it to create blood loss buildup when you attack with it. And it originates from Eocade, a land of proudly solitary ascetics, meaning they practice self-denial of their own interests, needs, and desires. And they do it in solitary, away from one another like hermits, kind of like the merchants. That land sounds pretty bleak and probably low populated as well. The same briars cover Elmer himself though, taking things a bit further. Once again we can learn more, but this time from the armor set, which after you defeat Elmer, you can return to the round table hall to purchase. Iron briars are a mark of the guilty as it turns out, to indicate a sentence of death. It was never part of Eocade's self-denial culture at all, just a sign of impending doom for someone who has been a criminal and judged such. However, Elmer never removed these. They became part of his fighting style now, to wound those that come into contact with the briars. Like the classic Kirk armor set from Dark Souls 1, an armor that you can wear and roll into enemies to deal damage, which is funny and nice to see it actually back in some form here. But yeah, the armor tells us something important, something vital. Elmer was a convicted murderer, sentenced to death to be executed by House Marius. We learn here that Elmer murdered numerous instructors and merchants, which was what earned him the title of the Bell Bearing Hunter. To recap then, the bell-bearing hunter was a known murderer and sentenced to death. After his capture, he was brought to the Shaded Castle, a special castle that's hidden away to have official executions take place. But somehow, this great warrior broke free, stole the famed blade of House Marius, his would-be executioners, but he didn't flee. He stayed and went on a full-blown rampage. Now, Elmer's origins are tied to a region outside of the Lands Between named Eocade. This is where he learned how to use that impressive telekinetic power. But why was he murdering instructors and merchants? How did he break free in the first place? These are questions I actually think I can answer. From the Nomadic Merchant's armor set, we can learn a little bit about some of his victims. The merchants were once greater in number. They thrived as part of the Great Caravan, but after being accused of heretical beliefs, their entire clan was rounded up and buried alive far underground. Then they chanted a curse of despair and summoned the Flame of Frenzy. It seems these claims were valid, right, that they were heretical and a threat, but it wasn't until they were literally buried alive that this happened. You see, the Greater Will wants to stamp out any and all other beliefs outside of the Golden Order. And with this aggressive tactic that they were using, they ended up creating a disastrous possibility for themselves. The Flame of Frenzy that they summoned must refer to the three fingers that summoned down there below Lindell. Because of that, a champion strong enough to become Elden Lord could come here and ultimately choose the Flame of Frenzy ending, which would destroy the Earth Tree, the Golden Order, and the lands between would burn. So clearly the Greater Will, not always making the best choices. But not all merchants are buried down here, of course. We do find a few of them around the world. Obviously, a few of them are really hard to find hidden away, but in some cases, they're just out in the open. It makes sense they would be kind of hidden away or like uncomfortable around people as they are when you talk to them, because the current order essentially has them as one 
talented individuals. But I guess things are so out of hand these days after the shattering and all that, that they're a low priority. However, obviously, someone is still hunting them the last remaining merchants who aren't rounded up yet. I'm speaking of Elmer, of course. It would seem his hunt aligns with the Golden Order though, right? You know, it's a task the Greater Will would approve of. And yet he was captured and judged for execution for his crimes. Like I said, I think House Marais serves the Golden Order, so why would this happen if they're aligned? Maybe it's the other part of what we learned. He murdered instructors, not just merchants. After all, think about it. Two of his invasion locations aren't near merchants. They're near other NPCs. The Warmaster Shack is where we meet Bernal in the daytime, who teaches teaches us various Ashes of War. Or there's the Church of Vows, where we meet Muriel. Both of these NPCs have reasons that align with Elmer's hunt though. Bernal serves as part of the Volcano Manor, who are obviously against the Golden Order in full. While Muriel is a different story. He's everyone's favourite turtle pope. He accepts you and the books you bring him, the sorceries or incantations, even if they are against the current teachings of the Golden Order. He himself is okay with what would be deemed heretical arts, because he has his own perspective on things. And there's this great meme about the line he gives you every time you learn something new from him, where they change it to, once again tarnished, weird, but not a sin. I speculate that Elmer took things too far, basically, going beyond hunting merchants, but those he personally deemed are against the Golden Order. Banal makes sense, sure, but Muriel? That's different. Muriel was there for the wedding of Radigan and Ranala. I do not believe the Golden Order is like against Muriel actively in any way, and yet Elmer was hunting him all the same. It's fair to say then that the other instructors that Elmer did successfully kill could have been due to his own warp perspective on what is against the Golden Order, and maybe he just took it too far and actually ended up killing those the Golden Order once alive and perhaps was deemed unfit for purpose and needed to be executed. A big question at this point then is why Elmer even served the Golden Order in the first place? He comes from a different place, he okay. Well, as we know, the Golden Order was created by the Greater Will. It's a cosmic force or entity that sent forth the Elden Beast from the stars, which worked as its enforcer. And ultimately, it was successful in creating the Golden Order and enforcing that not only on the lands between, but many regions around it too. For example, Eocade. We can learn more about it from the straight sword, the regalia of Eocade. This comes from the quote, lesser, long vanished domain. Eocade is now no more. I would conclude then that it was destroyed without a huge effort by the Golden Order because they had different beliefs and it was deemed heretical. It's likely they would bring in those that would join them, like maybe Elmer, and then use their abilities to serve their own purposes, like say, having them hunt down those deemed heretics. It's entirely possible that Elmer was part of that rounding up of the merchant clan originally, before then following his obsession with hunting down any that remain or any he deems heretical. In the end though, we can surmise that you were never actually the target of Elmer. When he appears and attacks you, you were just in the wrong place at the wrong time. He was there for someone else. Elmer, as the bell bearing hunter, took it upon himself to hunt those remaining heretics a bit too far and is kind of like a mad vigilante, becoming such a danger and problem to the land that he was sentenced to death. However, due to his really respectable prowess, he not only freed himself, but completely destroyed a house single-handedly. So, like the pursuer from Dark Souls 2 who hunts the player, Elmer hunts his heretical prey, and we just sort of stumble into it. But, the consequences of Elmer's actions reached probably a bit further than even he knew. When he destroyed the Marias family, I think he also damned the clean rot knights as well. So, let's learn a little bit about House Marias from three main sources. From the ghost found inside the castle, we hear this. House Marias is ruined. Just desserts were falling for that severed harpy. No surprise that guilty cretin took the castle and our storied sword. Now based on the painting of Melania, it must refer to her here. Somehow the house became exposed and just wasn't ready for the rampage of Elmer. The next item we have is the Valkyrie Prosthesis, a special arm that is used by clean rot knights. Once used by the one-armed Valkyrie, I assume Melania it refers to, it's a masterwork of craftsmanship. With practice and skill, it can be used as proficiently as a real arm. When Malay Marias, Lord of the Shaded Castle, embraced this prosthesis, he claimed that he felt the presence of his personal goddess. To me, it appears that Malay, the Lord of the Castle, felt very strongly about Melania. There was a kind of connection between the prosthesis the Clean Rot Knights used and House Marias. The main room where that painting of Melania is, is also lined with lots of Clean Rot armor and all those prosthetic limbs that they use. But the big surprise is we actually still find Malay alive in the game. 
somehow having survived Elmer's attack. Just to the west of the castle, we find him, still there, looking upon his lost castle. And sadly, he just instantly attacks us. Even though I'm pretty sure he'd be really happy if we showed up, took care of Elmer, and then left, and he could take his castle back. Fortunately though, we learn more from the equipment he drops, and it appears this indeed was Malay Marias, who himself was obsessed with the Scarlet Rot. The Antspur Rapier, his weapon, states that he found his own personal goddess, who we know is Melania. That main room that features her image, and the prosthetics made to help her, uh, all come from Malay's devotion to her. These tools give Melania the ability to fight, and equipped her clean rot knights as well. Malay's equipment tells us a bit more, that the sons of House Marias are sickly born, tied to the poison, rather than like the, the rot. But these two things, they're not so different, are they? The description hints at this, that it was little wonder that Malay was beguiled by the rot and Melania, who was born into it. You see, they both have an affliction that weakens them, poison and rot. So uh, it's a clear and easy comparison between the two. Now here's an interesting detail to note. The Marias robe is the exact same robe as the official attire, just with a black cloak over it now. That attire explains that yes, these magistrates were also executioners, but they also did surveillance and even gruesome rituals. So, the Marias family were likely picked to watch over the north area of Altus Plateau and ultimately serve the Golden Order as their official executioners. I surmise then that, due to his obsession with the Rot and Melania, he turned the Shaded Castle into a place of service essentially to Melania and her knights, neglecting their executioner duties for the Golden Order, and perhaps became a place of production for the prosthetics that the Clean Rot Knights used. A minor but interesting detail about House Marias is the many statues we find around the castle. So many kinds not linked to any one thing, but to me it feels like these were made here. It could be that Marias were creating the statues we see around the world. That would make them talented crafters, maybe suited to creating the prosthetics. And then instead of furthering House Marias and serving the Golden Order, they simply served Melania, which led to their ultimate downfall, giving Elmer the chance to break free. And after his rampage, the production of the prosthetics will have of course ended, and the Clean Rot Knights no longer had access to that supply. Elmer's actions, like I said earlier, probably had bigger consequences than he even knew. Look to the NPC storyline of Millicent. Without the Valkyrie prosthesis, she cannot fight. She cannot safely travel. But if you find that limb in the Shaded Castle and bring it to her, you actually return her to fighting form. Now that the Shaded Castle is defunct and fallen, the supply is now limited. There is no production. The survivors of the events of Caelid, the remaining Clean Rot Knights then, they're doomed to ultimately lose use of those limbs with no one to repair them or replace them. That's my speculation anyway. Elmer, without purpose, still hunts those that he considers heretical, even to the order that betrayed him. While the Clean Rot Knights can no longer rely on the production of their various prosthetic limbs, likely because of one poison boy's love for one rock girl. But there you have it. That's everything I could find and learn about Elmer and this bell bearing hunter. This was meant to be a, an easier topic for me to go into for a second video, but the more I learned of this, the deeper it all got. I am satisfied though, like with how much is actually tied to this hunter. An entire region, a combat style to do with telekinesis, a house of executioners, the love between a family of poison and rot, and of course, one particular talented fighter who took things a little bit too far. What do you guys think? Is there any theories you might have from what we learned in the official descriptions or is there something I've missed? As always guys, things like this are based in speculation. Only the official descriptions we read today are fact. So maybe you guys know something I don't. If you've enjoyed the video though, please do drop a like. It takes a lot of work to make a video like this and now I have more, more respect for the channels who are like dedicated to this type of content. Once again though, a big thank you for the support on my first one and hopefully this one is received well and I can come back for another. For now though, I'm definitely Lord out for today. So thank you for watching. I've been Hollow. You've been you. See you next time. Josh, Cotton, and Hollow with the videos. Dropping the humor like a hammer on your tippy toes. Bringing entertainment on a daily arrangement to take our insanity and turn it into entertainment. Yes, I said entertainment twice. To reiterate that it is nice. To look into your faces on a mostly daily basis when you let us in your homes to make the whole world a stage. Is, uh, goodbye.